being with other people who are training expands your mind, gives you ideas. There's feedback. You get inspired. There's no doubt that if you want to be the best tracer that you can be, my advice would be train hard, train with a lot of people, train with diverse people in diverse places, travel, learn different styles, different architecture. Like you need to immerse your mind in, in that zone. And that seems to me is where the best tracers come from usually. Um, and of course there's some exceptions of people that just figure it out, but there's no doubt that all of that, all of those ideas flowing into your spirit, there's no doubt it's going to be what, what gets you further as an athlete. What's up, everybody? My name is Adam Dunlap. I'm here with the Parker.com podcast. We're doing something different today. So I have Steven in front of, uh, with us. Steven, what's your last name? Water. Wood, Stephen Wood. That's right. Okay. Um, here's what's crazy, guys. Is Stephen and I don't know each other. What happened was is is in full disclosure, I own the company Take Flight, and we have this new community initiative where if you're a pro in the parkour world, we'll give you shoes. No re- no asks, no restrictions, no no nothing. Just send us an email. We'll send you a pair of shoes. So Stephen saw this. He wrote me an email and said, "Hey, uh, I'm a pro. Can can I get shoes?" And I said, "Uh, you don't." Well, I basically said no in the nicest way I could, but it's it's far it started this discussion between us about what was a pro and how we evaluate pros. And I said, you know what, Stephen, this is getting really interesting. What if I have you on the Parker.com podcast and we can discuss these ideas and hash them out together? And he said, Yeah, cool. So here we are. So Stephen Wood, welcome. Thank you. Before we go any further, um, you get a chance to to give your side of the story. If there's something I didn't say right or Something like that. Okay, so from my perspective, I'm clicking through my Instagram. I see this tape flight has popped up saying we're going to develop some shoes for professional any professionals. There's obviously other tiers you can get to. And me, I thought, you know what? I'm pretty good at what I do. I consider myself good. I consider my movements pretty good. So I thought, let's see if I'm pro level. I'll reach out to them just just to see what happens. And then when I was told, no, I'm I'm not good enough effectively not necessarily not good enough but my following on instagram isn't good enough and like i'm going to use names because like you said david nelms if he reached out to you he's a friend of mine i'll show you what i'm using his name if he reached out to you and why shoes you know cracked on straight away because of his instagram following whereas me and him jumped together and we're at the same level like like skill wise he could do some stuff i can't i could do some stuff he can't but base level skill we're about the same. So I had read that and I was like, whoa, what is a pro? What do you consider? Is it a case of you want as take flight as a company wants Instagram influencers or do they want parkour practices, practitioners, uh-huh. presser kind of thing. And if you're looking for in- influencers on Instagram, it's going to be difficult because like David, for example, if you reached out to David and was like, mate, I want to give you shoes. He'd probably go, roll it, I'll take your shoes, bring it up, bring it on. At the same time, they, I know David represents Olo, which is a, a different shoe brand. Not necessarily better, not worse. I haven't tried them myself. I haven't tried yours neither. I can't give an influence on that side of stuff, but I know he gets shoes from them. So he'd probably turn around to you actually and go, uh, conflict of interest. I've got a shoe guy. I can't run with you guys. That kind of thing. Oh, have you reached out to like Don Tomato? Really big guy, or uh, Virgit, Travis Virgit. Reach out to any of these guys. They're going to be like, my following is a good 20, 30 times bigger than yours. What's in it for me? Yeah, I get some free shoes, but I'll be basically carrying your company at that point to build it up to somewhere it's not already been. Whereas to me, it made more sense to reach to the younger lads, like the next year, the up and coming generation. Like, find the lads like John Cleave, Jazz. These lads on Instagram, they've got very little following. They've got like less than 2,000 following. I can give you a list of kids, not and, and some olders with less than 2,000 followings, but would jump at the opportunity to take some shoes from you, represent your company, and do everything for you because they're young, they're full of energy, they're loving it. So sure. you're looking for the people already up there. That mm-hmm. makes sense. You no, know, it totally makes sense. You know, uh, what we did is, is I love because you just jumped right into it. Um, oh, yeah. you're, jump, right? I love it. You're just, um, 
jumped right into the conversation of of some of the ideas we talked about. And uh, you brought up an idea literally that I've, it's never quite occurred to me as articulately as you said it. What you're differentiating be between, it sounds like, is pros and influencers. And what you're yes. saying that there could be overlap, like you could be a pro and an influencer, but there doesn't have to be overlap. So you could be a pro, but not be an influencer. And so exactly. what you're saying, is that, you're saying is that when Take Flight said, we'll give free shoes to parkour pros, you're basically saying it wasn't that articulate because you're basically conflating you're combining the idea of influencer and pro into one. What we should have said is we'll give pro, we'll give shoes to people who are parkour pros and who are influencers. That's what yes. you're saying. Then I wouldn't reach out because I'm not an influencer. I don't have that following. Fair. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a fantastic point. I think you're totally onto something. I think you're totally onto something. I think, I think you're actually right, actually. I think, um, you know, as we, in the discussion that we went back and forth with, it was, um, what was it? It was clear to me that, and I think I said this to you, that we didn't have clear lines of what a pro was. Yeah. And yeah. so that's why I said, yeah, like Kadori or Dom or Pasha or David Nelms is like, yeah, hundred percent. There's people that are the hundred percenters. Like there's no doubt if they want to wear our shoes, we'll give them shoes. Um, but then, and then there's people on the other end where you'd say, no, like if someone just started parkour, you know, I don't know, they're 17 years old. Uh, they tried it yesterday for the first time. They're like, Hey, I'm a pro. We're not going to give them shoes. Right. But then you have everything in between, the obvious no's and the obvious yeses, and there's some in between, and there's a middle ground there that maybe isn't clearly defined. And uh, we didn't define that it takes flight, and I knew we didn't define it, and uh, and you called us out on it, more or less. And that was totally fair. Is this accurate? I think we're on the same page here. Yeah, basically, yeah. Because, like I say, I don't know a lot about the history of take flight, but I've done a little bit of research. Before, like when you said you wanted to do a podcast, I was like, okay, I'll do a bit of a dive into Adam, see what Take Flight's been doing. Because I know you've been around about as long as I have, but I took a lot of time out. Like recently, I, I sent you a screenshot where a picture of 12 years ago, you'd on Facebook, Cook Take Flight. I'd liked it. No, oh, this is crazy. crazy. This is crazy. Yeah, I'll bet. 12 years ago, a whole different life. For everybody listening, we planned this, this podcast and said, okay, yeah, we'll talk. And then Stephen went through his Facebook and found an image he posted in 2011 that take it was one of the Facebook memories thing that pop up, so it just kind of it, it showed itself to me. It was like desperate, and Take Flight liked it, and this is 12 years ago. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, you you did a deep dive. You you figured yeah, you did some so. research on me or on Take Flight or something. Yeah, and obviously a lot of what I saw were. Take flight, started to get a bit of a sketchy name within the parkour industry. You know, people started not liking so much. And then I watched uh, one of your previous podcasts. I went onto parkour.com YouTube page and I watched most of it, but I was putting it on a silly clock so I didn't end up falling asleep. Not a bad thing to fall asleep. It's very got a nice voice. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to partner with the call map and you can listen to the parkour.com podcast and fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, but uh, anyway, I noticed that the last video, it was around a month old, or a week, couple of weeks old kind of thing, and it had less than 100 views. So now that my, in my, my gear started ticking, I was like, hang on a minute. This bloke's got less than 100 views on his YouTube, then like he's looking for influencers to push his brand. He's not put the work in himself yet. His brand's not already, I mean, the influencers aren't noticing his brand because he hasn't got enough people following him. He wants the talent, not the influencers. So, like, going back to the younger generation, if you reached out to, like, I'm, I, I know, I don't know American younger lads, but I know some of us I've jumped around with in, like, Leeds and surrounding areas in England, and they've really humbled me. I'm like, where I, I, I'm fairly old now, 33, and I've seen these 15, 16 year olds do stuff. Which you never even thought of it. It blows my mind. You know, it blows my mind. Like, it really is. There's a lot of you know, standing from caster side kind of thing. So you kind of travel to the side, so traveling forward. Landed on a rail, stuck it first try. And I'm like, this is a 15 year old kid. This kid's going somewhere. Snap them up. You want them before we, the other brands find them. They're the kids you want to, to push your brands because then they're the, they don't know about the history of Take Flight. They're too young for that. So the history of the bad times, what you went through, you've come back through the other side, you've kept yourself alive, I'm impressed. You kept the brand going, and it's coming back out the other side, and it's picking back up again. 
So you want the younger generation to take it to the next level. You're right. Well, look, you know, um, you're giving me, um, well, this is quickly devolving into a, a, a podcast on business strategy. See, I'm not a businessman. I don't know business strategy. I know what I look like on the streets. I've never done a business yeah. hotel. Well, uh, I need made that about and what works. Well, it, it is, a. I can tell you this is quickly devolving, which is awesome. I mean, not devolving, maybe evolving into a business <laughs> strategy discussion because your ideas are good. Um, some of the things you said, I disagree with. Let me start with one thing. So, uh, Parker.com is wholly different from take flight. So, uh, Parker, I just use that because you put them both into this podcast is for Parker.com says Parker.com yeah. kind of thing. So I bring that up. Yeah. Oh, God, um, well, yeah, I was, I was confused. And then tell me again, you said something like you went on the Parker.com site. There was this post. It had a, uh, a, a hundred views on the YouTube, on the YouTube, YouTube channel, like YouTube. Or the no, my, on YouTube. My on YouTube channel where the podcasts yeah. are. I'm yeah. guessing it's quite a new small channel, but it had less yeah. it had views or something. It's brand new. It's brand new. Yeah. yeah. It's brand but new. But the same time, and... UI, one of the lead teams, they created a brand new channel, released one video, and within, I think it's up to about 1,000 views now because they advertise, like, it's these guys, we, we advertised it right, and then the videos are getting the traction. Whereas you know YouTube channel, it's still not got much traction yet. There's a lot to build on there. There's a lot of, of ways to go. I can't tell you how. I don't know how. I just I can just see it and knowing it's still quite down here where it needs to be up here. Here's where I vehemently agree with you. Uh, I think your ideas are great. Um, on, on the take flight side, because like I don't want to be here to speak for take flight because this is a Parker.com podcast. But to speak for take flight, I would say take flight would love to work with some of these lads. Like they sound awesome. They're full of energy. Would absolutely love to. So um, that's where your ideas are great. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I agree with you there. I think it's a great idea. I don't have any disagreement. I mean, I, you know, connect me with them. We'll talk to them. We'll see if we can get them some shoes. We'll see if they like the shoes. So obviously a company like Take Flight, we, this kind of gets back to the business idea. So Take Flight has to make money. Right, a company has yeah. to make money. It exists to make money, and when what is money? That's a whole another rabbit trail we can discuss. It's about value. So if we can make a T-shirt for ten bucks and sell it for twenty bucks, then that means someone deems that worth twenty dollars. So we extract that value from the market, and then we use that to either fund the company or to make new products or to put food on my table so I can eat. Whatever it may be, we're all in that grind of you get the the life credits that we call money, and you put them to work for you in different ways. So. Ultimately, Take Flight has to make money. And so the idea comes then, okay, how do we make money? And that is actually kind of a multi-pronged thing because I, I don't think that's actually the, the initial question. I think companies exist to make money, but I think that the why a company exists, there's a deeper, there's a deeper answer to that. Um, for example, you could say, if every company exists to make money, but then why does Take Flight not make um, lampshades or... Um, um, you know, insulation for housing or plumbing equipment or something. And so that gets kind of why. Don't think about that, but you know quite a bit about parkour clothing. Exactly, right. Exactly, right. So it's like, so take flight, yeah, you say it, and a conglomerate, it has to make money to exist in the same way that, like, you have to breathe. Like, we don't, we don't live to breathe as humans, but we have to breathe or we can't live. So that's how I view it. That's how my view is companies, people like Kevin O'Leary will say they're there to make money. I don't agree. I, I just think, Money is like the oxygen or the blood flow that a company needs to survive. And the company is an organism that's there to do something. So anyway, you combine this all together and you say, okay, probably the better we do what we do, the more money we will make, which then empowers us to do better things. And so it's this, I don't have the answers. I'm not a billionaire businessman, but the idea is we want to create a great product. We want great people wearing it. We want those people talking about it. Some more people want to wear our product and we want to take that money and make better products. And we want that to be some cycle, some cycle, cycle, cycle. So a part of that is product development and part of product development are things like financing. And then another part of that is marketing and marketing comes down to things like where are you going to buy? Are we going to buy social media ads? Are we going to give shoes away? Are we going to uh, find affiliate codes? Are we going to post on social media? Are we going to have social media? You know, take flight and porker.com alike don't have Snapchats. Why? Because I decided we don't want them. We don't have TikToks. Why? I don't know. I've decided we don't want them. So 
you know, we, you decide where you put your energy and then based on how well you're doing things, which might be the product end, it might be the marketing end, might be the communication end, could be the financing end. That gives you the resources then to do other things better, right? So how come we can't give Dom Tomato a million dollar endorsement contract? Well, because two reasons. Number one, we don't have enough money to do that. We don't have enough energy to do that. And number two, if we had a million dollars, we probably wouldn't give it all to him. We'd probably give some to him if he wanted to work with us. He might not want to. And we might give it to other people. You know, we might spread it out. So there's all these considerations and variables could go into these decisions. And you're bringing up one part of the business strategy, which I think is brilliant. It's work with young up and comers who have energy, who are excited about the brand, who will talk about you, who will create for you. And uh, I think it's a brilliant idea and we'd love to do it. Yeah. I'll say this bit of stuff. Yeah. I'm running off of my personal experience. And when I was starting Parkour, I got the sponsors. I got, like, not the big companies, but I got companies reaching out to me, giving me free stuff. They weren't shoes at all. And I was like, t shirts, energy drinks, coffee, weird stuff, just stuff that the companies have sent out. Like, for example, the No Fear energy drink, when that first arrived, I think that was 2010 or 2011. But they reached out to us because I saw my YouTube, I did on YouTube and was like, yo, cool. we're going to give you six packs, uh, six cans of energy drink per day. And we did that for two months. In that two months, I was obviously hyped up because I was full of energy drinks. But I used that energy because I was so grateful for these guys think appreciating me kind of thing. And just yeah. being willing to send me even pity stuff. Like I got a, a kite off them. A kite and you fly. No purpose for it whatsoever, but I was amazed. I was so grateful because I was 17. I didn't know no better and I just loved it. So everywhere I went, I did videos. Like I did all, I got asked to do two viral videos. I didn't know what a viral video was. So I did what I could. Ended up making them like 40, 50 different videos as well as running around the street screaming, everyone should drink no fear. No fear energy drink is the best thing ever kind of thing. It, it did me internal some nasty business because I went a bit silly on it. <laughs> but that, because <laughs> I'm young, I don't know no better. So my entire life then revolved around that company, which is what you need. Like, honestly, like I say, I don't know a lot about business. I don't know how to keep a business alive. I don't know the financial side of it. I just know how hyper I got representing a company because they were willing to give me a t shirt and a pair of socks because I was young. Now, I know I've drilled that in already, but I kind of keep wanting to drill that in more. You, you reach out, like with your ads, wanting uh, professionals to reach out to you. In my, I might be wrong, but in my personal opinion, anyone who's got the social media influence and the skill level to be like up there, professionalized, kind of crazy good, probably ain't going to read one of them posts and go, I want you to send me this. I'm going to reach out to this guy. Because people, they've already got 200 people in their inbox reaching out to them, saying, I want to give you this, I want to give you this. They don't think about reaching out to someone else. And they're not going to respond to ads like that. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. I mean, I, I think you're right in most of that. Um, you know, the vision for Take Fight is we make the world's best parkour shoe. And not everyone's going to agree with that, but it's a... It's a brand question. It's very brand. brand. I'll do yeah. that. I'll tell you what, every shoe company probably thinks they make the world's best shoe. Oh, everyone thinks they do the best thing ever. But yeah, like to, yeah. to advertise, to put that as your tagline advertisement, best park or shoe. I mean, K-Swish tried that one when they first kind of brought theirs out. I think they called it Ariaki. And they were like, park or shoes made for free runners, best shoes you'll ever have. Every free one, including myself, who tried them shoes, got a month for wear out of them and soles fell off. You know what I mean? You also have obviously a long way to go of testing mm -hmm. ability, but it's still a very brave claim because Storo have a shoe, uh, Bolo have a shoe, you guys have a shoe. That's three big names competing against. Are you sure you're better than other two? Oh, I, tried we're them. I think we're definitely better than their shoes. But here's the thing, like there's the humility to say if they think they're better than us, like good for them. So, you know, it's like it's being confident in who you are. So, for example, like if you look at the greats in, do you watch basketball at all? I'm not up. No, uh, it's a big sport over here, and I'll just take an example from it. It's like there's a bunch of of uh, like all the all stars think they're the best player in the league. They all think they're the best, 
And that's part of what drives them to continue competing and being better. And like, it's very clear that a couple of those guys aren't the best. No, but Kobe Bryant thinks he's the best basketball player ever. LeBron thinks he's the best basketball player ever. Michael Jordan thinks he's the best basketball player ever. And to me, it's totally fine for them to all think that. And then it's up for the the world to debate who do we think is better, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. And so to me, it's up to the world to decide like what's better, a take flight shoe or an Olo shoe. What I do know is that Dom, Kadori, David Nelms, Toby Seeger, anybody in the Verky, anybody in the Parker world, uh, except for maybe Matthew Jang, they all want shoes to train it. Right. Oh, yeah. Ed, 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 so, and guess, and, and they have to buy them, right? I mean, unless they don't, don't unless, unless some people might be getting shoes given to them. Um, and some of them might find $20 pairs of Feiyus. They're like, ah, oh, who cares? They're my favorite shoes anyway. And they're, they're, they're cheap, but we make a great high quality premium shoe. And, uh, it's something that, that people want. And we've reached out to them and asked people like, Hey, do you want these shoes? And, uh, to your point, some of these people have so many followers, they don't even see messages from us. We don't even have, we'll send messages at parkour.com to people like Dom and Tasha, and they don't even see the messages. We're like in their other inbox. So it's like, all right, yeah. part of it is just getting on people's radar, you know, but that's life, you know? Yeah. I've, I've had a, a chat with Dom in, on Instagram recently. Like you said, you, you're not able to get into it, but I'm one of the few people who very, very rarely does get a response off him. Nice. And cool. His Instagram is fully a business. It's not a, like mine's a, a platform. I put my clips on just so I've got someone to look back on. And I think it's great. And if I can inspire other people to to watch my clips and go, I want to get out and do that, love it. That's best thing. That's the best I could do. Whereas Dom, he only he will only upload if he knows it's going to be like be received well. If that if that makes sense, yeah. Like that would be set going back with yourself with the shoes saying. Uh, Best, best shoes in parkour that that to, to you obviously you see nothing wrong with that but I want to put a different spin on it yeah. and be like that could as a British person to me that seem, that doesn't seem like a yeah yeah prove me wrong that seems like arrogance and I'm thinking yeah. this guy <laughs> you guys have my <laughs> culture <laughs> yeah we're, different. we're all over one we think different so like you could be you could be in fact the best shoe out there undisputable it could be a fact but because you say it we won't buy it because we're like nah you all think you think you're too good already i'll go to wallo i'll go to Storo. that you're running it i mean i'm not saying everyone thinks the same i'm just saying you're running that risk yeah you know i mean oh, you're treading a fine line between confidence and arrogance yeah you know i mean that is one i would say that is 100 percent cultural so we don't think that way in america and it's one of the things that makes America different is we have, there's something about our belief structures as the American culture. We believe in accomplishing big things. We believe in stardom. We believe that people can accomplish dreams. We believe that success is good. And these things, I don't know what the UK. I can agree with believe most of everything on this side of as well. You agree with most of them? Yeah, we're pretty much on the same page. Just success is good. We, your, your dreams can come true if you work for them. But whilst you're still working, we don't tend to claim to be best because we're still working. Like you say, going back to your basketball reference, you've got eight, nine different players all saying they're the best and it's pushing them to be better. In a, in my mindset, if I'm sat here saying I am the best, I've got number one, I am top dog. I don't need to push myself any further. I'm already up here. I want to be third. I don't want to be first because I want to be third because that's what's giving me the drive to push harder, to become first. If I'm already first, what am I pushing for? I'm already at the top. In in Barry, you should all, if you are if you're the best shoes out there, well, give long long longevity, comfort, grit, don't cripple your ankles, and you can basically take any impact whatever, and will survive. Why are you not already a millionaire? Why have you already made it? Like you're the best. You should already be there. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I look, it, I think, I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying, right? Um, the truth is that if they were really this super shoe, wouldn't everybody wear it? Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. Um, I mean, I don't have a rebuttal because I think that's that's uh, there's truth to that, but like. 
there, I, th I think there's some more nuance in business. And also, um, I disagree with your premise that just because you're the best doesn't mean you don't have motivations. So um, I think, I honestly think Take Flight's the best parkour shoe of all the parkour brands, right? Now, we don't market it that way. We just had a conversation and I just happened to say, we I think we have the best shoes. And then you're like, oh, well, you can't think you're the best. I'm like, no, 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 no. We don't market, like, look at our stuff. We don't even, we don't just market. Yeah. Right. Like, I can't remember where I read it, but on one of the articles, which I'm pretty sure was written, I think it was that the 10 worst parkour brands in parkour kind of thing. It was an article written by yourself and you was writing about Take Flight as a third person. In that article, it's a quite an old article, I believe. It's sort of what just, I don't know where I found it. Mm. But in that article, you did describe the shoes as the best parkour shoes ever. Oh yeah. Well, you know, um, this is like an old, this is old. So you're actually speaking to some of the, some of the things that I think that cause a lot of negativity in, towards take flight. And this is like 10 years ago, but the first shoe we launched, we launched it under the marketing campaign, something like the greatest parkour shoe of all time. Right yeah. now, what's so funny about that claim is at that point in time, it was like the third parkour shoe ever made and arguably the first ever parkour shoe designed and made by tracers because you had Ariaki and they're a, a K-Swiss brand. And then you and had, all... you had the Kalenjis, uh, from like, uh, WFPF and they just copied a shoe. It wasn't a parkour shoe. They just branded a shoe. And then you had three run, but they were like, they said they did free running. So I was like, you could argue that this is the first parkour shoe. And then you had Olo, but that was made by people who weren't parkour people they just like had an idea and worked with some tracers in massachusetts or somewhere to make a shoe so when take flight launched the 1.0 in 2014 i think we launched it for pre-sale in 2013 there was an argument that this is actually the first ever parkour shoe made by tracers in the history of of the universe and so when you when we said the best shoe ever um it's funny because i did believe it was the best shoe now it's clearly not but at the time i believed it was and also, there's a funny argument that it was actually like the only one when it launched. So yes, it turned some people off. Guess what? It also ignited other people to be passionate about the brand and what we did. So we had a double-edged sword. Now, that being said, to, to glance ahead, and then I'll let you cut in. I stopped that type of marketing because I felt like, I feel like that works for certain types of industries, but I realized it doesn't work for the parkour industry. And what I think works for the parkour industry is making a good product, being humble, sharing positivity, supporting tracers, showing love, these types of things. Now, I've been doing that, but there's no virality. Nobody gives a crap. And so it's like, you're kind of caught between this catch 22 of, well, then what's the secret sauce, you know? And our shoe is legit good. Not only is it legit good, it comes with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So if someone like wears it for three months, like didn't last as long as I wanted to, or like doesn't have the grip I like, we'll just give them their money back. So it's like, I don't see any, anybody else offering that, right? So we have this, we have what I feel is a value proposition in the parkour world. A great shoe designed by tracers, worn by pros like Joey Adrian, Evan Storm, Lilu with Red Bull. And we say, buy it, no risk. You don't like it, send it back. We'll give you a refund, anybody in the world. Well, so to me, it's like no one else is providing that value proposition. So I think we have the best value proposition. Does that make it the best shoe? I don't know. It depends how you analyze it. But that being said, I don't want to market it that way. Anyway, so these are all a brain dump for you to hear different perspectives and ideas on, on some of those things. So the floor is yours. Thoughts, ideas, response. And I have questions for you. We definitely tangented, but I have some great questions for you about parkour too. Go ahead. No, okay, I'll keep to two, two questions, my way. I'll, I'll get back onto this a little further down the line. I'll start derailing myself anyway. ADHD started kicking in. No, I mean, you have a great energy and a, and a great mind. And I, and I don't think you should sell yourself short either. When you said, for example, you, you didn't know anything about business strategy. I think business is this universal concept. And I don't think I'm a great businessman. Like, I think I'm probably 3% of my business potential or maybe 6% or something. I'm still very, very low. But I also believe that at the core of business is about communication. It's about humans. It's about value. And we all understand that innately. Because every day you go and spend money on you know, something to eat or you know, a, a theater show or the movies or whatever you're buying for somebody or flowers for a significant other. Like, it doesn't matter. We're always spending money. And so we innately understand this idea of value transfer. And we innately understand the idea of choices. And we innately understand 
choosing things that have more value by some rubric. And so when it comes to business strategy, I think like that's some of its core, I think, is understanding human psychology and understanding people's wants. And so um, I think you and most people are actually, you know, much more about business than you probably think you do. But that's what it takes someone who runs a business to be able to see that. To me, I just see what I see around me and I think, oh yeah, this is useless information, which I can just dump on someone else who knows what they're doing. You're a guy with a business, you know what you're doing. You probably better use the information I, I don't as actual use, useful information. Whereas to me, it's just a ramble. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think maybe the biggest thing that people who aren't businessmen don't understand about business. And again, this comes from the humility of saying, I don't consider myself a great businessman. I built multiple companies. I sold one. Um, I think take flight would be at a different level if we hadn't have had some weird things happen. So there's some, there's some unknowns, but I will say simply that what people don't understand about businesses is, is you're limited sometimes by your resources. So, uh, you could say the money is a resource, but money is a reflection of human time. So the question at take flight would be how much time do the people at take flight have to do different things? And I would argue that maybe I don't have the time to research the up and coming 15 year old tracers in, uh, in, in uh, Leeds, you know, or something like that, right? Now, maybe I do, right? But if I do, do I think that that's the best use of my time versus developing our next, next product or getting our financial situation in order or dealing with customers or whatever it may be? And so when you have limited resources, which is time essentially, you have to allocate them in certain ways. And so someone from the outside will often say, well, I think you should allocate your time this way. You're saying this, you're saying, I think you should allocate your resources to these unknown kids in my city. And I'm like, okay. Not necessarily in your city. Probably closer to home, so your shipping's not as expensive. But you, like, it's more just the demographic more than the actual people. Like, I, bought, I could spit out a list of people around my area, around the joining cities, which right. it end up costing you a fortune to send them shoes. Whereas if you link up with some of the events that happen near you, ignore the professionals, start talking to youngers, like you might see all this crazy stuff going off in background, but you'll also see this craziness going off with youngers, focus on them, ignore big ones. But like, are you at the events anyway? It could work. No, you're at the event. No, it could. Uh, and because parkour is a community, it's not a business. It's not like that. If you, like, I'm 33, I'm perfectly happy going up to like for example jazz is a 15 year old kid i use him because he's one of the younger ones that i personally know but i've got no issue at 33 walking up to a 15 year old and being like mate i love what you're doing let's jump around together any other lifestyle discipline anything like that it's a little bit weird yeah but i was a community we're all a family and aging a thing skill leveling a thing everyone's just happy to be together so you can just go up to these youngers and be like, lad, I love what you're doing. I I represent such and such. Let's let's team up. Yeah, you'll have to talk to the parents. Usually, the parents are at these events. It's easier to talk to them. Then the kids can go one off. You can chat to parents, and you can create your connections there. And then all the kids need to know is the parents are getting them shoes from Take Flight, and they're going off and doing their own thing, going crazy about it, loving it. That kind of vibe. No, I'm like, like, no, I mean, I, you're basically speaking to like a really cool idea, which is, which is, um, change what athletes you're pursuing. Now, the thing is like, my business mind says this, it says, it sounds all good, right? But executing it becomes very difficult. So like here, here are the questions that come to mind. How many kids are we going to target? Like how many, how many pairs of shoes do I want to give away? Like that's question one. Doesn't necessarily need to be shoes, can be t-shirts. You have take flight t-shirts, wristbands, hats, anything with your logo on it. Shoes are for the, the kids that hit the top tier, but still kids. Sure. sure. T-shirts, you do your socks or whatever, and for the kids that are showing progress. When them kids start going to a level of they've shown progress, they can build up to a shoe contract or shoe sponsorship. You don't want to start giving them shoes straight away. That's what I'm trying to say. Like you offer shoes out to everyone. You go on basically like myself, flying up in your, your inbox, 
just chancing it. Which is fine, which is fine. So there's another question then. What do we give away, right? T-shirts. Okay, so, okay, so give away T-shirts. Okay, so how many T-shirts are we going to give away? This is this is like an honest discussion, but I, I you know, like I'm, I'm going to follow this to the end so we can have this interesting business discussion. How many T-shirts should Take Flight give away? Let's say in your world, in Stephen's world, how many T-shirts do we give away? Well, in my experience, I did a an event called Jump Leads in 2010. I, in that event, I teamed up with a company called Subspecies. They granted me 100 T-shirts. Okay. That 100 T-shirts, every single one of them found a home. And to this day, you still see people wearing them T-shirts. That cost, it cost me nothing because I was running the event and the company helped me. But after talking to the company, it was most of their back stock that we couldn't sell. It was all the, the stuff that we've had sat on shelves for ages. So obviously, I don't, I'm not saying you're going to have that. But you basically find your cheapest product, but whatever's the cheapest you can make, knock out a hundred of them, they're going to be everywhere. Like, All right. All right. So let's say Take Flight decides we're going to do, uh, we're going to give away a hundred t-shirts. All right. Uh, let's say, let's say we can produce them for $10 each. So we're doing a thousand dollars investment plus time. Okay. Like, and, and this is a genuine conversation I want to have with you because I think it's interesting to, to hear it through and hear your thoughts. So, okay, we've decided we're going to give away T-shirts. T Under T-shirts, it costs $1,000 plus some time. Who do we give the T-shirts to? Do we find a gym? Do we uh, message people on Instagram? Who do we give them to? Events are a big thing. Because after I came back to Parkour in 2020 after taking a long time out, and I've learned events are the biggest thing. Like, I've been to Sheffield Takeover, York Takeover, there's... This year, there's going to be Manchester takeover, Liverpool takeover. There's Nova City's Project Underground, biggest competition in England. They're all ticketed events. You buy tickets, you go to the event. If you buy a spectator's ticket and go to them events, you're going to see the heavy hitters throwing down as big as the camp. You're also going to see the under-16s category. That's where you want to focus. Big events where there's cash money prizes and it's 15 quid for a ticket to spectate is where you want to go. That's where you want to focus. Okay. I think that's a great idea. Okay. So what, so we're giving away a hundred t-shirts. Uh, do we, what events do we go to? Like there's uh do we go to one of the, uh, park world competitions? Uh, do we try NAPC qualifier? Do we go to the WCPKC, the West coast park world championships Do we go to one of their events? Um, do you have a specific event in mind or are there a couple of events in mind? Well, in England, we have different, like a lot of different events, different takeovers, different challenge events. Right now, a bloke called Adam Daw in Sheffield is running uh, five challenges, two hundred pound per challenge. I've seen him. Not for any particular reason, just because he wants the challenges to be done. So far, three of them have been done. He's wanted to see these challenges get done since he was a wee kid. Now they've been done. It's costing two hundred quid a challenge, but he's got a lot of people into Sheffield. It's a bit of a tangent, I know, but you know, I've wanted to throw it out there. No, I, I remember seeing this and I was like, dang, like I would love to sponsor that. Like I would love like have take flight sponsor the, the challenges. And so like we pay the money when people do the challenges, you know? Yeah. Um, and so people, a yeah. Doll, you would probably jump on that because he's got a small following, but he's not about trying to do it for the following. He's like, oh, you want to throw cash to me so I can give it to my community. Amazing. I'm all over that. Oh, you want to give me products so I can give it to my community. That is incredible. He would probably jump on it. But like at the same time, he's one of the people that run the event, which is Project Underground. This year is number 10. Like I say, it's the biggest event in England. There's 200 pound cash prize for like first place. There's women's division, men's division, kids division, speed, skill. There's all sorts of different things. It's over uh, three days, I believe. I say, that's the kind of event I'd personally go to if I wanted to sell stuff because you allowed t-shirt stands. At the same time, you can look out for the talent and offer our sponsorships. I don't know if it's like that in America, but in England, the Project Underground is the number one competition event. So that's why I focus. Like the other events are all like street events, like takeovers, which is basically you got 50 challenges. You've got a day to do it. Here's a Google Maps link to all the challenges, crack on, which is an amazing idea. I love it. So your idea to distill your idea down to actionable steps, you're saying find a really big event, print a hundred t-shirts, 
and then give them out to people at the event. Yeah? Yes. Obviously, people that have stood out to you, so you're not just throwing them at random, you're not just throwing them into a crowd and hoping for the best. You're watching my talent. And yet, you, even even at the events, offer to be giving, like, first set players prize. Go, like, rock up and be like, look, I'm here. I've got 100 T-shirts to give out for all the day to best people. I've also got a pair of shoes. Put that, give them to your first place winner. That's your thing. And then whoever wins that competition, all of a sudden get some take clad shoes. I'm like, oh, that's cool, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we, we've talked some competitions about sponsoring their comps and saying, like, there's one competition here. Um, I forget who I was talking to. Well, no, I know who they are. I just don't know where their gym's located. But we said, yeah, when you run a competition, let us know. We'll, we'll donate a pair of shoes for first prize. So, like, we've done that before. Um, you know, maybe we didn't scale it large enough. But um, I think your idea is an awesome idea. Like, find a, I mean, my mind goes to partnering. So my mind says, okay, how do we partner with, like, NAPC or WCPKC, these competition circuits? And what if we said, hey, guys, we want to be, like, a title partner, and we want to give a T-shirt to every person who competes in all of your qualifiers? So then there's something like that. Because you also realize it's like, oh, I'm here in Portland, Oregon. We have a couple of parkour gyms here. It's one of the most gym dense cities in uh, in the world, I think, definitely in the country. But we don't have a, a ton of like really deep community events, right? Like you know how they had last year store put on the that wall event? Yeah, that was yeah, a fun I, event. I've yeah. never seen anything like that in Oregon. I mean, the closest See, thing we ever had. A common thing in England. You could be the guy who runs that event. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's. I mean, I couldn't. I'm not. I'm not English. How would I run? Like, no, I mean, in your own city in Oregon, you could yeah, have a guy to set up the event. It won't like, happen. Well, crap. in Leeds, one of one of the my one of my uh, close friends, Freedom, is called Dominic, but his Instagram tags like Freedom Gaming underscore or something. Uh, he he had basically, I think sixty seven followers on Instagram, and he's like, I've just started parkour again. I just created a new a new Instagram. I want to run an event. He just, he just went, like, I'm, I'm doing an event in Leeds uh, one month from now. He then started flagging it all over Instagram. He got 600 people there. Wow. And like, you know, it, it's, it can be done. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was an insane event as well. It was great. He, he didn't, no prizes, no cash giveaway. It was literally just turn up, jump harsh freeze, we'll take it at spots. It's great. Have a good day out. That's awesome. Yeah. Bravo. And that's really, well. It can be done quite easily if you're willing to just try. So, like, you like, say you've got quite a lot of gyms. Put flyers up in gyms for one day event hosted by yourself at this spot. Stick it all over your Instagram, your personal Instagram, your business Instagram. Start like reaching out to other like Instagram pages and ask them to follow your post. Like, not necessarily big big names, but reasonable sized names, but like just other athletes. Like I'm doing this event, can you share my post? And then you, you will be able to create your own community event. And if you said it's gonna be a good day because people show up, people will jump, you'll get a good video out of it if no else. But it's gonna be a good day and people are gonna go, Who set that up? That would take flight. That was a sick event run by Take Flight. That was amazing. Yeah, it's gonna be a, a bit quite time consuming set up, but not as bad as you think, because you're all gonna know all the spots. You don't reach out for commission because it's not an official event. It's a meetup. It's a gathering. And there's no cash prizes. And you're not losing out. At worst, you're giving out free t-shirts. And if someone really excels, they've got spare shoes. I love it, man. This is an awesome idea. What you're making me realize is that is that my approach to take flight, and this is definitely, a, and I've thought about this a lot, but I made a lot of mistakes running take flight. And perhaps one of the mistakes was i was i've always tried to run take flight as more of a corporate from like a corporate vision and a scalability vision and you're advocating a grassroots movement type vision right a, yeah a feed on the if thing, you want right? to not to feel involved in the community of part of law sure this community like when i was young it was just groups of people scattered all over the place you know for best now I've come back to it since 2002 to two, uh, yeah, 2020, 2023. I've, I now know people in every city in England because of Park Law, because it's now a community. So if you're trying to run a corporate business, the community's going to be like, nah. But if you show yourself as a community member, they're going to be jump on. We're going to be more inclined to be like, 
I want to support him because he's a community member at parkour, not someone who did parkour and is now trying to make money off it. Sure, sure. Oh, I think your ideas are great. I'm going to tell you uh, an interesting story because I, I think when I think back, this you're causing me to have a lot of different ideas and thoughts. And one thought is, well, why didn't I do this? And so I have an answer for that question. And uh, it brings us to today. So what's interesting is that my first company wasn't Take Flight. It was a company called Revolution Parkour. It's a parkour gym. And it was one of the first parkour gyms in the country. And I think when I opened it, our own facility in 2010, I think it was the biggest in the country. And now, of course, it's it's daunted by by dozens of gyms. But for the time, it was it was this interesting, like, innovative theory because parkour gyms were not common back then. So I started this company. Then I started Take Flight. And then in 2011, I had the chance to move to France to work with David Bell. So I said, I can't be in France working with David and run Take Flight and run a parkour gym remotely. There was too much on my plate and nothing had reached a financial level where I could hire people and put it in place. So at that time when I'm running the gym, I'm building a community, actively involved in teaching. And for three years, I'm building this really ardent, strong community. And that community was so strong that I think I had five students go on and start their own gyms. So it started this fire in Portland, which is why Portland is in some ways a parkour hub in the sense of the number of gyms we have. Um, that being said, once I, so I'm moving to France and I'm realizing I can't do all three of these things. And my heart was, I want to work with David because he was my idol and he was the person I wanted to learn from yeah. and be so. way, more important, way more important to me than revolution parkour or take flight. So I can't do all three. I decided to sell the gym. So I, I pretty much gave the gym away, but I technically sold it, passed it on to somebody else, moved to France, hired a manager to do some stuff for me for take flight. So now I'm running to take flight remotely. And what I realized very quickly was that the guy I hired, who was great, he's a friend of mine, was the first person I did parkour with. Cool guy, to this day, I love him. Um, he didn't have the experience or the initiative or the wisdom, some combination thereof, to run the company on his own. I had to run it. So I would spend, this was very common, I would spend all day with David, then I would come home and work till three or four in the morning doing take flight stuff, ordering products, checking finances, developing product, social media stuff, all of that. So I did that. And so from 2011, you could say to 2015, I was involved uh, heavily with David and also Parker.com came along. So then I'm running Parker.com and it was building into something very, very cool. We built a, a pro team with people like Shade, people like Charles Burnett from France, um, a whole slew of athletes from around the, the world that became a part of kind of the parkour.com pro team that we used to build that. So all this needs to say is that that kind of brings us to say all those, those other things is what I realized is that when I started Take Flight, there wasn't much of a community. It was very, very dispersed. In my business plan, it was a, how do we address a geographically diverse market? It sounds like now you have some cities that, and we'd have it through, through gyms, we have gyms that can that can support themselves you don't have a geographically dispersed market you have enough people in one city to support a gym take flight wasn't you know parker wasn't that way in 2007 2008 it was all it was all dispersed so i started uh, take flight in that geographically dispersed market and the vision was how do we create a brand that resonates with people in every country and uh the answer was not go to gyms, not go to events. The answer was sponsor and support the biggest pros in the world, make the best gear in the world and make sure they all have it. So Take Flight grew out of this, you could say. It needed to be an internet strategy, I think, in the beginning. And maybe there's some argument that it could have been different. But in the United States, I think it needed to be an internet strategy. And then furthermore, when Parker.com, or not when Parker.com, when Parker started to develop where it had more of a community, I'm doing stuff in France, working with David and I'm like, dude, this company is doing its thing. Like it's found this velocity. It found this energy. We were doing crazy sales through 2015, like just bonkers sales. We were about to break through and do some really cool, really deep community stuff. And I'm like, this system is working. In 2016, we were going to take all the biggest pros in the world or all the biggest pros from the parkour team, people at the time, Oscar Sanchez, obviously the guys from France. But our pros from Mexico, from Canada, from the United States, from Spain, from Russia, from the UK. Working with Toby Seeger in 2014, Will Sutton, 
we had this crazy team. We were going to take all the pros and fly them to lease, spend two weeks in lease shooting this crazy, crazy project. That was the vision, right? 2015 happens. And instead of growing 30%, like we had done every year before that, we flat, uh, we flatlined or not flatlined. And we just, we just capped. And then next year we decreased 30%. So all of a sudden now what happened is we were, I think we were ready to break through and have this really deep involved community vision. And then finances just went chunk. So now I'm like, holy crap, I have to actually cut members from the pro team and cancel their contracts or the company's going to go bankrupt. So all of a sudden this thing happened, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, life propagates. And then from 2016 to, you know, 2015 to 2018, I was like, just trying to make the company survive while developing more shoes while trying to save relationships. And as you pointed to, there was so much negativity around in flight from a lot of these people on the fringe, a lot of people from England, right, frankly, who I despise to this day, who would, who would post hit pieces and speak bad about us and pros wouldn't respond to our, like, I'm rambling, but this is interesting history. So I think it was in 2013 or something, I sat down and I wrote the top, I think 50 or maybe top 100 pros in the world. Like, by following count, like all the best known people in the poker world, I wrote them an email and I said, Hey, we're building an endorsement team. We have endorsement contracts with financial contracts. Are you interested in being a part of our team? Uh, can we open the discussion? And I had pros that, that wouldn't even respond to us. And I, to this day, I don't know why, but I suspect a lot of it was because there was this really deep negativity around take flight, which goes back to maybe how I built the company. But a lot of it goes back to these internet trolls and this community. And what I've learned in life is that it doesn't, you don't need 90% of people against you. You just need like 3% of people who are really vocal about it and really vicious and they can turn your brand to toxicity. And we see this online and social media on the news channels. All of a sudden you just talk bad about this person. They're a womanizer, they're a pedophile, they're a, a criminal. They, they abuse their, their first wife, whatever it may be. And all of a sudden sponsors drop you. People won't talk to you. Nobody works with you, even if it's not true, even if it's just a rumor that someone said. And a month later, someone's like, oh yeah, that rumor wasn't true. He, uh, that never happened. doesn't matter. You're branded. And so take flight, I think, got on this, on this negative side that when we were ready to deeply involve in the community, two things happened. Number one, people wouldn't talk to us. Number two, finances started to drop. And that became this vicious cycle of, do I even want to keep running take flight? Like I poured my heart and soul in my own way for six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years into this company. And all I got was massive hate, not making any money, getting massive hate. People won't talk to me. Toby Seeger, who I adore, he just got up and left, left our contract. Pasha Putkins, we're working with him. One day, he just never writes me back. I've never talked to him since. I was sending him money. One day, he just went through, wins the art of motion, never talks to me again. Uh, people like Sean Wood, who I adore, obviously leaves, feels like he can do better starts a competing company, like a bunch of our pros went and started their own competing brands. So it's like, all of a sudden it was like, whoa, like lots of negativity, no money, no love. I've never talked bad about anyone in the community, but everyone's talking shit about me. And I'm like, do I even want to be a part of this anymore? And so anyway, all this is to say, like a lot of interesting say, things to say. For me, it was never as easy as, oh yeah, just go to an event, give people free t-shirts. It was never that easy either because it wasn't possible at the time because my interests were dispersed, 100% my fault, uh, because there was negative publicity that I couldn't figure out how to get around, or just maybe I wasn't wise enough and smart enough, which is definitely a part of it too. So, wow, there's like a 15 minute ramble, however long I talked for. So I think your ideas are brilliant. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say is your ideas are brilliant. I wish Take Flight had done this years ago. Part of me wanted- It won't be three years ago. That's not what I'm trying to say, because years ago, take flight started picking up and up and up. And then it, like you say, it just kind of, it, you were yeah, going up and up every year and then it just leveled out and then started dropping. Yeah. So when that happened, that's because that was back then and you couldn't go to these events, you couldn't do this, this, start of it. But like I said, since getting back to part one and seeing how much it's changed since then, when you, what, when you think you should have done then, it wouldn't have worked then, or it will work now because the, it, like the culture has moved on enough that going to the events, doing the like the stuff you were doing back then, not necessarily aiming for the top tier pros and building a pro team because 
probes already build their own proteins. Like you've got Don Tomato teaming up and making Team Fran. So Team Fran are now heavy hitters doing the wrong thing. Filming Capstone, that's not Team Fran, that's a whole project around finding heavy hitters doing that. So now you don't want to find the heavy hitters. You don't want to do that. You want to find, the, like like you said, effectively taking parkour back into the cash cow business side of stuff. You can guarantee your $100 shoes, I'm, I'm 33, I'm not going to buy them. I can't physically afford that. I've got a mortgage, I've got food, I've got a wife to sort out. I don't have no kids. Other parents who do have kids and their kids come home and going, ah, mommy, mommy, I want shoes. I've seen take wine. Their, their parents aren't going to think twice about it. They're like, hundred hundred dollars for a pair. She, if you show, show up, you can have them. Because that's the mentality now. When we were kids, that weren't the mentality. It, it worked. Nah, sod off, you don't need it. Nowadays, it is. <laughs> that's how it was for us, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's the same in America, but in England now, if, if a kid wants it, a kid gets it. The only reason most of our parkour gyms are still open, like there's one in Leeds, it opened up, it's called uh, Level Up. It opened for three years, exclusively to free runners, to, to people who practice me out of parkour. And Leeds boys, the heavy hitters of my city, all went there, all drilled it, got some amazing footage, but it weren't making money. Yeah. That's now, that gym itself is open, I think, three times a year to us actual free runners or elders who want to jump around every other day of the year is running classes from two-year-olds up to 16-year-olds because that's the dynamic where the mums are going get them in there that's going to work you're not going to miss a beat because they want the kids out of there and it's a cheap way, cheap place to do it it's like yeah nowadays yeah. you want to wait for that demographic to, because the parents will buy your shoes they won't think twice about it whereas myself like I'll just yeah. I'm currently running clenches. Yeah, brand new pair of shoes, cost me thirty-five pounds. I run these. I bought FP insoles, which is a, a different another brand. Takes the impact out of it. The insoles cost me uh, forty-five dollars to get from America. I got them shipped over. Now I can buy thirty-five pound pair of clenches. Don't matter what this is like, because these insoles take away ninety percent of impact. I don't need to buy expensive shoes anymore. I don't need to take flight shoes. I'd like them because they're, pop they're going to be way better than these. But I, I don't know the difference, so I'm not going to put the money down. Parents will. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you're touching on a really cool concept, and that's a, the, the parkour industry has changed. It's clearly changed. And I've been talking to a lot of parkour gyms in the United States lately, including Jimmy Davidson, who I interviewed here on episode two of the, of the podcast. And the market for parkour gyms is kids. Yeah. So w when I started Revolution Parkour, I had a lot of high schoolers and a lot of college students. Now, the parkour gyms are all kids, like elementary yeah. school, middle when school. When you started it, the only people who knew about it were the college kids, the high school kids. The, yeah. the younger kids never had anything to look at. There's now 10, 15 years of videos for these younger kids to get excited about and want to get involved. So you want to win to get them to get on board with them as their finding parkour. They don't know your history. They don't know anything about it. Anything. All they know is this is amazing. I know, right? Yeah. Well, we had we had one person I spoke with the other day said, you know, we'd love to sell your shoes at our gym, but our our students won't pay a hundred bucks for shoes. I was like, oh, okay. So in some there's you know there's marketing, there's branding, there's you know kids' shoes are usually less expensive. That that's whole that's a whole another business strategy. Like who do we want to market to? And you would also have uh, making smaller shoes. Make yeah, you make a smaller shoes, less materials. They cost less, but not that much more less. You know, it's not that much less. Um you know, I, I think this gets into kind of some business weeds, but I've decided that I want to make premium products. Like I'm not interested in making thirty five dollar shoes. They just don't interest me. Like maybe they cost the same, maybe you know, there's so many problems with making products that cost less that I'd rather make really awesome products that cost more money. And that's uh, just a business strategy. And so that might price us out at certain markets. It, that's what I'm saying though. Nowadays, like this generation, our generation as parents now think as a kid, I could never get this. It doesn't matter about the price anymore. They will pay. If you can find, if you can find a way, I can't tell you a way because I won't have a clue, 
But if you could find a way to sack off these big names and everything, because you don't need them. You just need people who can move well to be able to get you good content, to be able to show that good content to the younger generation, get them excited about your shoes, the parents will pay the big money for them because the, it's just how it works now. It's a ridiculous concept. I wish you were like this when I were a kid, but it seems to be how it works now, at least in England. Okay, so tell me this then. Let's let's go with your content idea, right? So Dom Tomato doesn't want to wear take flight shoes. If he did, he could get a million people to see the shoes, but he doesn't want to. So we find some lad in Leeds, in Leeds who's 15, is doing like a standing side pre to a rail first try. And we're like, hey, dude, here's some shoes. And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, I love them. Oh, sweet. These are awesome. My sticks are even better. And he makes some video, right? Who's going to see the video? Now he's not just making videos. Now he's going to events and he's placing high in these events and people Maybe. are seeing him. Maybe. That's what it's all about now. It's all about going to events. So if you can get your product on these kids in the events, it's going to be seen a lot better than a YouTube video is going to be. Right, but you never know who's going to place in an event, right? And a lot of people are great on the street, but they don't go to the events or they do. They get nervous. They don't place. You know, there's a, there's a lot of unknowns in that capacity. So you might well, be right. He might cool. place, but he might not. Well, even if we don't place, like my first competition coming back, I didn't even remote the place. I did, however, gain 200, 200 300 followers on Instagram because I was at the event. Wow. And then that made it so I could go to a, a takeover event in which I'd, I was stopped on a bloke's sofa I'd never met before. But he just went, yeah, I've seen you on Insta. You move pretty sick. You can crash here with us. That sound. At that event, I, that was a two-night event, I then met three, four hundred other people who now follow me and have all met me. So I now know these people. My Instagram following is tiny, but if I go out on streets, everyone's, hey, who's there? How are you doing? It's great. Like, I'm starting to go to these, if I didn't go to these events, I wouldn't know any of these people. But it didn't matter how I placed, as long as I had a good attitude at the events, the community, don't care how good you place, it cares how good a person you are. Obviously, you don't know how good a person he is just by his Instagram con content. So it's going to be difficult for you to decide who you want to give your stuff to. But that's why I say to you, go to these events. Find the people who are showing that, you know, might not be top tier, but we're talking to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, it's a good idea. It, I think that I'm going to push back a little bit. But I, I want to first say that I think it's a great idea. And to me, you're clearly on to something. And to me, you're clearly teaching me things that I didn't know about the community because I grew up in a different time. And not only did yeah, I grow up in a different time. I only know these things because I come back to the community after yeah. such a big time. Yeah. Well, also, in addition to growing up in a different time, is even when there were things like jams and things like that, I was never interested in them. I was just interested in, in training hard, getting strong. And, uh, like I was a bit of a lone wolf when it came to my parkour journey. And I never understood yeah. why people. I have learned that being a lone wolf does not get you far in parkour. No. It's all about community. Well, what, what do you mean by, by far? What you, we're going to tangent here, but what do you mean by far? Uh, so for example, there's say. I'm not joking around. Physically, do you mean physically or do you mean... Oh, physically. Like, you'll be in the best shape of your life. You'll be pushing your mental barriers, your physical barriers. Right. You'll be constantly pushing yourself physically. Right. But you'll have no other people there to spark ideas on different flows, to, to point out what, what could be improved slightly, to clean up your technique. So there's a lad in Leeds. He's, he's a good, good lad, really nice lad, good at what he does, good at parkour, good at training. He's, he's got his own following. Is doing quite well for himself. When he comes, on a very rare occasion, he comes out into the community, because we all know him, because he was part of it, he's took himself out, he does his own thing. When he comes back, you can see so much progression in that one day, right, he's back with us, than you'd see in a month of him being by himself. Because there's people around him going, that was sick, what will make you better for is this. Or, that, that was a fast flow, you hesitated half a second up on this bit for. Do it again. Don't hesitate that half second there. There'll be a rapid flow. Kind of thing. Which, the stuff you don't notice when you're by yourself effectively. Unless you're filming everything you do and then watching every clip and cr criticizing every movement. That kind of thing. But not many people do that. No. 
No, I mean, I, I agree with you here for sure in the sense that um, it depends what your goals are. And that's why I pushed back on FAR because I, yeah. I wanted to say, what did you mean by that? But I, I think that there's no doubt that being with other people who are training expands your mind, gives you ideas, there's feedback, you get inspired. There's no doubt that if you want to be the best tracer that you can be, my advice would be train hard, train with a lot of people, train with diverse people in diverse places, travel, learn different styles, different architecture. Like you need to immerse your mind in in that zone. And that seems to me is where the best tracers come from usually. Um, now, of course, there's some exceptions of people that just figure it out, but there's no doubt that all of that all of those ideas flowing into your spirit, there's no doubt it's going to be what, what gets you further as an athlete, in my opinion, and from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's nothing stopping you, obviously, getting really good by yourself, drilling it, getting stronger, just work, picking, like, for example, climb-ups, they're a big thing around our area, getting that good solid climb-up, getting it clean. Sure. There's a few lads around me that will spend day after day after day on their own smashing that climb up and all they're doing is getting tired it's taken to someone who's better at climbing with them going yep yeah, now what when you get to this point here your hands are here want to be here it's it's like that much difference but it makes all the difference in the world if you didn't have someone telling him that he was going to continue that climb up for like six months never getting faster but someone told him and he's like boom now he's got faster now he's like up there he's all on his feet now he isn't he's up there because the tech, you know, you can't like figure out some techniques by yourself. Some you can, but some techniques, like everyone's techniques, slightly different. But sometimes you can't quite get it unless you're shown it or helped with it. If that makes sense. No, it, it's totally it. No, it's totally it. It's like it's like all right. If you want to go reinvent parkour from the beginning, like see how far you can get, right? And if you want to, you know, and maybe you'll become the next David Bell, great. But you know, you're not gonna there's an easier way and easier ways to learn from the people around you and the people who came before you. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Like, it, it's like, like myself, like yourself. Okay. We were in it from the very like early doors of, of park off free running. We were basically the people figuring it out. Yeah. We were figuring it out, man. Yeah. Yeah. We were just making it up as we went and then it built into something and the stuff that worked, worked and the stuff that didn't work, we sacked off. And now the next generation of the next people coming and want to start training, new people coming to start they need to be with the people who've done it already. So we're not wasting my time figuring out all the stuff we've already backed off. I know, right? And they have the internet, which is helpful. I mean, that's where parkour, you could say, spread anyway. But it's it's pretty inspiring you say to see somebody do it. Go ahead. But the internet might not necessarily be the best thing for parkour. Controversial topic, yeah. But personally, I think Instagram is killing the spot. Oh, really? Okay, here we go. Let's talk about it. Why is Instagram killing the sport of parkour and so effectively like for example i want to put in i'd put in like four or five hours work to, to get this perfect line absolutely bang on i've got a 2.5 second clip that could that clip is down to like basically because i've got a somewhat low following it's down to fear whether you're seen or i personally have to two seconds my phone's just ringing oh yeah Get a video call from Liam BPK and the locals. Liam, what's <laughs> up? Ask him to join us. Join us. No. My no, volume's just gone through. It seems to have broke. Can you, can you speak a second? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm my here. volume has dropped on his ass because of that phone call. I don't know what's happened there. Oh, uh, crud. Uh, well, you know, you can always leave and come back. If you just exit and then exit back in, maybe. Uh, you can't well, hear me. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Hear you. Well, I'll make this point while it's still fresh to my mind. Otherwise, I'll forget. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah. So, basically, I I could put, like, in my experience, I have done it. So, I've gone out. I've spent time work building some of what I think is absolutely amazing flow run. And I've done that, and it's a four second clip. That gets 200 views and no lights. I then go out fucking about my minutes. And I do, like, I've got a clip on, on my TikTok. I've got a TikTok now, because so I'm down with the kids. So I've got a, a video on there, which is viral. It has 20 million views, and it's a case of I'm holding on to a bar. I swing forward. I can't leap onto a little electric post. 
with tiny little finger moves in it. That weren't even something we're going to film. That's viral. That's what people see. It's like, why? It's just stupid. But even though that went viral, two days later, no one knows. No one cares. It's forgotten about. So Don Tomato, first person to do the confront down in London to this little silly ledge thing. That was an amazing, wow, oh my God, world's first. It, the world went crazy for a day. And it was forgotten. Because it was flooded by all the other Instagram clips. It, you can't go the same kind of viral anymore. There's too much. And Instagram is just flooding you with all these free second, like some good, some shit, make your own decision. But in the YouTube days, you saw like three minutes at least and you knew what were good to watch. Now, half a second, scroll, scroll. You, you don't even know what you've just watched. You've just been bombarded with it. Indeed, I'd like to comment. Can you hear me or no? Yeah, I can just about. I'll sit a bit closer. Oh, dang it. Do you want to, why don't you, why don't you exit out and then come back? Maybe the sound. I'll, I'll get out about fucking two All minutes. Right. All right. Do we have audio? We're back. Yes. 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 Uh, <laughs> well, as you don't know, we had some technical difficulties, <laughs> but we're back. Uh, yes. Well, um, can we pick up where we left off? Uh, yes. Okay. Try. We're just explaining how you feel that Instagram is, in your language, destroying parkour. What was your language? What did you it's say? Killing. It's killing it. Killing it. Yeah. You're killing it. Yeah, there's is like uh, there's like so much content. Back in the day, GUP would come up with a video. Oh my gosh, GUP dropped a new video. Everyone goes and watches it. It's mind blowing. Maybe you watch it a couple times. And there's only videos. Capstone released videos. Everyone gets crazy. You've got your big yeah. project like Motors used to the, the closed down now, unfortunately. But Motors were a company that oh, a company a parkour team that did big videos, pay per view videos an hour long and you loved it and that stuck with us but like instagram's just an half a second it's it's not the same it's, to, to me anyway i waste way too much time on it and i, I had no take there's no takeaway there's no like i look at him like okay i'll cool. yeah that'll cool. it was too much like i know i keep repeating myself now but i'm just yeah it's just it it does my it when is the last time store launched a big project so they had roof culture they had super tramps and then When's the last time they did something big? Uh, the wall run competition, that was their last big thing, wasn't it? That was a, a community event rather than a video. And they made a video out of it. Maybe they got out of traveling and sleeping in hammocks or something. <laughs> they got old and boring. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what they even then realized they can't jump like they used to, so they just kind of building big events to bring in the next generation of store army to be like, keep it going. Yeah, they're smart. They're smart and trying to expand their clothing line now. And, and... Yeah, like I said, they've just take, like Stora have taken on most of the motors team. So they've now got more professional t-shirt design or clothing design people to focus on yeah. their clothing aspects. So they will focus more on their own parkour aspects. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an untapped market for them. I mean, as far as I can tell, their their clothing never seen that developed. In my opinion, it was never that interesting. Sometimes a couple pieces were the web, but I'll tell you, the website wasn't compelling. And so, there's a lot of untapped potential. And if they do it right, they I would expect that it creates a really good revenue stream for them. They could, you know, really do some great stuff with it for sure. Well, personally, I don't own a single item from Stora, but that's just because you know it's, I don't feel right. Where I've been around just as long as them. I've, I've had a little bit. Dude, this is the, so. This is the truth. Is it's like, it's weird when you knew somebody. It's like when you came before them, or you knew them when they were nobody, and now they're somebody. You don't have the same fandom, you know. Yeah. It's like ask ah, store. It's like you know, I was around before store. Like you know, like I paid Toby Seeger an endorsement salary every month to work with my company. Like totally en enamored with what he's done. Bravo. But I don't have a fandom. It's like they're just guys, you know. It, it almost yeah. equalizes you with the celebrities when you knew the celebrity when they weren't a celebrity, you know? Yeah. Like for example, 
I will. I don't own any Sora clothing, but as you can see, I've got WY clothing. This is West Yorkshire. This is my area. This is what we do. I've also got companies like uh, Team Reality. That's uh, Grimsby. I've got group. They've, they've built a gym. They've a group. They've created clothing. So because it's a small group, I support them because they're an up and coming parkour group. I bought their merch. Like pretty, pr uh, pretty parkour is a female only rope parkour clothing company. So I've got, I bought their merch for a small company, they're com up and comers. Mm. I don't have any uh, take flight clothing because that's been around since when I were around. Da, those guys. <laughs> um, take flight, take flight. What was I going to say about them? Well, you know, what I think led to the shift in take flight and the reason that take flight wasn't able to accomplish what I felt like we were destined to accomplish was people stopped buying clothing. It was really interesting. We were selling massive, massive, massive amounts of apparel. I'm convinced we sold more apparel in 2014 than to this day, probably any parkour brand sells in three years. I mean, we just massive, and I don't know, I could be wrong there, but we sold so much apparel, it was crazy. Like we had a warehouse with, with a thousand t-shirts in 2011 when I moved to France. And those are just turnover like mad, just every day shipping out t-shirts like crazy. And then what happened is, is I thought, okay, well, we're introducing shoes. We're going to, we're going to keep increasing our clothing sales. The shoes are going to add to that. You know, at this point, the, the business is efficient. We're going to have more money. It's just going to continue to turn into our pros. We can pay them more, more initiatives, more projects. And then clothing just stopped. What happened is even though shows came in, we sold the same amount, I think between 2014 and 2015. It might have been 2015 and 2016, but one of those those years we just went clothing dropped and then shoes filled in the gap. And then what happened is clothing dropped the next year again, and then the shoes didn't make up the gap. And what we found over the last, oh, about eight years is that clothing sales have declined every year. And I was like, whoa, I'm so glad we shifted to shoes or the company wouldn't exist in its current form. Uh, what's the point? Mm, I don't know. The point is, is that for a while there, parkour clothing, you know, buying a parkour t-shirt was cool. And now I think people just don't care. And sure, buy a t-shirt from your team or a, a company you want to support. But it's not, there's not like mainstream parkour t-shirts. There was for a while, there aren't anymore. There's no mainstream parkour or anything anymore because it, every community is building their own community up in their own yeah. city. Yeah. Their brother in cities are joining their community is coming together. There's no one big hair. Stormers probably a big hair at this point, and not many people care about them because the, like they do. But I'm saying they don't care about them. But but like you care more about the people around your own environment, around you, around like. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's it's like yeah, I I personally support the group, the smaller companies, what are up and coming because I've met them and like I know that part of a community, the community run, community built company. And that's what you need a bit to win in part all now. You need a bit the community. The community need to look at you and go, Yes, you are trying. You are doing good for part all. You're not just trying to make money for you. You're trying to bring part all to the next stage. Like in events, in competitions. Like when we were kids, when we were younger, I ran jump leads in two thousand ten. I got so much hate for that. Because parkour is not a competition. Parkour will never be a competition. Two, D, two years later, our emotion kicks off. Everyone loves parkour competitions. Are we too soon? Yeah. Like, you're over the point now. You've already got the shoes. You've already got, you know that's a working product. You know people are loving it. Get the, get into the community. Start creating these events. Start like, creating these competitions. Get yourself off. Like, I don't know, I don't know if you still train. Or people who like you know who train, get them creating community events and get the community word of mouth out. Cause it don't matter how good a pro you've got jumping around, no one's checking what Burke is wearing and on his feet because he's got a pretty park t shirt. He's supporting the underdogs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, too soon. I want to comment. There's like three things I want to say. Number one, too soon for sure. And that's where a lot of hate came from with Take Flight is Take Flight is sellouts. It shouldn't be making money from parkour. Who owns the company? How much are you making? I was like, guys, it's a company. What's wrong with having a company? It was just yeah, too soon. It. it was just, it was just a riddle too soon. Just selling t-shirts yeah. was just, 
you know, and it, that could have been mitigated, you know, like P like Daniel Lavaca, we sent him a t-shirt and he wore it, uh, in the early days. And there's, I have a photo of him in like the MTV parkour challenge. And so there was ways to mitigate that negativity by that. I could have done a better job at, but I also think in a macro vision, it was primed to get hate because of the timing, just like your 2010 event was primed to get hate because of the timing. And I'm not the first the kind of people was it may have, the, the whole discipline is, was still new. We didn't know where we were going to go. No. So skateboarding got the same hit before they, when they first started coming about, soon you start making competitions, it gets hit until money starts flowing and then the hit kind of stops. You were kind of the company that got the hit before the money could start flowing and the hit stops. You're ready for your round two now. Yeah, well, you know what? I felt that I thought we were going to break through. So, you know, like it was pretty painful for me to have some of what happened. I mean, Kai Willis came out with a, with a hit video. Tim Sheaf came out with a hit video. People were like burning take flight clothing for a while. And it was pretty, uh, and I wasn't making any money. Like I was doing it, like I was giving all the money to the pros, you know, but I didn't do it in the right way. And so they weren't getting that much money because there was, there was too many of them, et cetera. But the point being is my one saving grace theory was that we're going to break through. And we're going to have so much money that the true heart of the company will show in time when we're writing big checks to big pros, financing their projects, their visions. And then we just didn't break through. So it is like we didn't, we couldn't, we couldn't get through the, you know, the, the army, just so to speak. You know? Well, I may be wrong on this one, but I'm, I, I can think like take fly when you were just up and coming, just getting yourself, getting you, you brown now there. Your closest competitor uh, was probably Urban Free Flow. Them kind of vibes. And the amount of... Because Urban Free Flow did it wrong. They, they did it wrong. And the people behind who ran Urban Free Flow were wrong ones. And but because all parkour, all the community knew back then were, this is a big company that's got three winners together and give them t-shirts, give them shoes, give them money and treat them like shit. So what if Take Flight's doing the same? And we didn't think about it. We just jumped on bandwagon. Like, Urban Free Flow is the enemy. Companies are the enemy. Take maybe. flight must be the enemy. Maybe. Urban, yeah, maybe they uh, they did us dirty just by nature of being bad. You know, it kind of like, yeah. kind of like absorbed onto us. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm just thinking because we were both around at the same time and there weren't many other people out there trying to do what you were doing. They did it so badly, it kind of had a ripple effect. Maybe. They've been forgotten now. They're just a bad joke in the community. So the ripple's over. You better go again. Yeah. No, it, it's a better time. You know, it's the advantage of being a first mover is that you get to establish yourself without competition. So we could send t-shirts to Pedro Salgado and Leo Orban and, and uh, you know, any pros, Stanis, uh, Stas. We, we could send t-shirts to all these people and they would wear them, which was great. We built the brand. But the problem with being a first mover is then you have all these, you're the first person to, to explore the new territory. And so you're going to like get eaten by all the bears and get eaten by the mosquitoes and drown in the river. And you know, you have your army is going to get decimated just by nature of being first. So, uh, now that isn't there. The world understands, Hey, have a parkour brand, sell t-shirts, support tracers. It's awesome. It's great. Let's have it. But the barriers to entry are higher. Why? Because there's more brands, people have their communities, people have the shoes they like to wear. So now it's a whole different set of problems. The problems are, okay, wait a second. How do we break through that mess? You know, maybe the first mess was trying to break through the PR, trying to have the right publicity to stay on the right side of perception. And now the mess is, dang, how do I get connection to people? How do I convince people that I'm different from all these other opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a different set of challenges, I think now. Like, like if you wanted to have a parkour competition, right? Like, and you wanted to make it really big, right? You know, the first event you did in 2010 had, if it was the first of its kind, it would have been much easier to, to maybe have people come to it. Maybe. Oh yeah. Maybe it, it, it ended up basically advertising itself. And I had people from America flying over for one day really? event. I my mind. Really? Really? Yeah, in 2010? Was, in 2010, two lads from Morocco flew over as well, and they ended up living in Leeds for six months. They just didn't want to go, didn't want to leave. But they only came over for that event. And I was like, wow. 
But then I made the mistake, because like I told you, we had that group of level up, our gym in Leeds. When they first came over, they came up from London, already establishing a parkour qualification, had their gym already going. So they came up and I handed the reins because I were like, I just want to have fun. I didn't have fun at Jump Leeds. I was judging it. I was So I want you guys to run it. And they just didn't. We just let it die. And I was like, oh, well, that was a wasted opportunity. I should have kept all of that. Let out. It is tough that way, yeah. Um, you know, I wonder that about myself. If if I is like, you know, the stuff you're saying. I love people. I love supporting people. I love groups of people. But I never wanted to do parkour to be in front of people. And in fact, the only reason I started my company, Revolution Parkour and Take Flight, was more or less because I needed to survive. And because I didn't, I I felt like the right people to start a company for parkour were the people that didn't want to start a company because they would have the right heart and they're the ones who could build a company in the right way, putting the discipline and the community first. But I didn't have a desire innately to make money from parkour or to be involved anything outside of my own participation. So this also makes me think that when you talk about going to events and stuff, although there's a side of me that loves that, a part of me doesn't like that at all. I never wanted to do that. Like you didn't want to judge the competitions, but you wanted to have a competition event, right? I mean, I would- I just want to to buy. Yeah, I would would love to go to a parkour event and just be there. I got to go there and hand out t-shirts. I got to like, hey, hey, you're really cool. You want to wear a pair of shoes? Hey, here's something. Like, I don't want to do that. I just want to go and enjoy the event and like be a part of it and jump around. Like I was at a, you had to take flight. We posted a, a video of Evan Storm. Evan Storm's an athlete we're working with. He's an up and comer. He's great. Uh, I'm cheering big for him. He comes to Portland on a road trip last week. I go up to meet with him at a jam. So it's him. You have uh, Josh. I, I don't. I don't know some of these guys' last names, but you have a really cool group of guys at this jam. I'm there. Evan needed a pair of shoes. I gave him a pair of, uh, of our second gen shoes. He's training. And I'm like, dang, I'm caught between wanting to jump, wanting to be here to support Evan. You know, what What if he needs something? What if he has questions? I'm here for him. Uh, I also have to get footage of him because I know we need to actually utilize this moment to have some content for Take Flight. So I'm like half recording him, half trying to jump, half trying to warm up, half trying to talk to people, Ezzy and Josh saying, hey guys, you know, if we can do anything for you at Take Flight, let us know. And it's like, I don't want to do this, man. Like, I just want to jump around, right? If I'm going to do this, put me behind a computer so I can send emails, so I can make phone calls, so I can call businesses, so I can create partnerships, so I can design product. I don't want to be out here peddling take flight stuff. I don't want to be out here filming. I just want to jump around and play and and enjoy this time with people. But it's like, dang, I got a company. Well, like, I got to do some stuff. So let me pull out my phone and take some footage, you know? And I do it with a happy face because I, I understand the value of it. But it's like I'm a little bit I resonate with what you're saying because some of it's like I don't I don't want to do that, man. Like I I didn't get into parkour so I could sit behind a desk and, and go to jams and hand out t shirts. I got into parkour so I could train. So I could enjoy the movement. So I could evolve as a human being. And it's like, dang, maybe I should never start a company. You know? <laughs> maybe I should never have done it. That's basically why I would done it. Like I, I thought about starting my own clothing brand, starting my own company up. I thought about it many a times because nowadays it is quite easy to do. Like you can just buy the equipment to start printing at home. You can upgrade the equipment as you get sold. It's not that difficult to make t-shirts. Shoes are different, man. But t-shirts, hats, all kind of stuff. Cups. You can get it all pre-made. It's easy. I couldn't do it. It takes up too much focus away from what I want to do. And what I want to do is be moving. So like, so you, you already too deep into it you've already got your company you've already built it all kind of want to keep it going you have to sacrifice some of that moving to be able to keep it going look and i'm old anyway so you know past my prime i never achieved my never past my prime. you know i'll tell you what i bet you if i trained hard for three months and didn't get injured i bet you i would do bigger jumps than i've ever done like i don't think i'm actually yeah. past i don't think i'm past what i achieved as an athlete but i'm probably past what i could have achieved so I can tell you from my personal experience. Yeah, I did six years consecutive non-stop when I started. I started up, did six years, and then 2013, 
absolutely ripped my hand off. It now does this. It did. What it do you, you do? I ran it through my motorcycle rear sprocket. So I had my motorbike up on the center stand. I was cleaning it all up and then started the engine up. Uh, I'm crouched down to saw my tick over out, lost my balance. When I'm not into gear, when I went on chain, it went around socket, around the sprocket, teeth went straight in. I had two and a half years of physio recovery time, and that basically that put me into a, a bad time, went to a bad place. And then got back out of it, started rebuilding, and then started park over again. And in that time when I'm coming back, my first six months or so, it hurt. It felt like I ran a marathon every time. Like I'd go training for one day, I'd come back, I'd be like, oh, now I'm too old. I can't do it. I'm done. And then have a week rest and I'd go for another day. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm two years back into training. Every other day I'm out there smashing jumps. I'm doing bigger than I ever did in my childhood. I'm got my mental game is huge. I've got grown up strength now. My jumps are bigger. My climbs are quicker. It's, it's taking more work to keep going because I've got to go to a gym now to keep the strength up. I never used to. I can't do like a 24 hour parkour session, 12 hours on pace, straight back out into parkour. I could win all 17. Can't anymore. But I accept that. And I'm like, right, can't do that. Can still do this. I'm going to train hard. And I, I can also say at 33, I'm probably better than I ever was a, as a child. So your hand got pulled into the, I don't know much about motorcycles. It like pulled into the chain of your motorcycle. Oh, it was on the chain. So, but yeah, crashing to a, two seconds out of back yeah. at once. Take your time. Yeah. <laughs> We needed more stories like this from parkway.com. Stories about injury and recovery and triumph and failure. And, you know, you go to Instagram and you just see a bunch of really cool jumps. But I think all of us that have been a part of park for a while know that it's not that easy. So we'll give him a second to find, I don't know what he's going to find. Maybe some gear or something like that. Maybe a drawing. I don't know. All right, what do you got? So I kept as a souvenir, obviously. So it was a BFR 750 motorcycle. Holy oh, so, crap. Chain of sprocket. It was a 750? 750cc Honda BFR. Holy, no one needs, no one needs so, a 750. <laughs> my hand know. went there. No. It got to there. No. Yes. Did it break your wrist? <laughs> uh, once my hand got stuck in there, it got halfway around, and then because I turned the tick over on the engine down so low, the engine cut out, just turned off. Because the chain got so tight, it cut the engine out. So my hand stuck there, I about to reach over, put it in neutral, get the tire, spin it back around, and like, it, from there, there, and there, we're hanging off. There is going to be something. Hang it off. But it went all the way through. I had ligament damage, tendon damage, shattered the bones. The only thing holding it on was a bit of skin on this side, and the veins were still attached. Because the veins were still on there, the surgeons managed to rebuild. I didn't lose my fingers. But it did take two years of physio to be able to go like that. Oh my gosh, man. That's the craziest injury I ever heard of from a parkour guy. Yeah, it's a non-parkour injury. Figures. Yeah. Yeah, I swear to you. My, my two biggest injuries were like non-parkour injuries. Go figure. Go figure. All my worst injuries have been non-parkour related. Parkour is the only thing I've got my, my brain in focus so I know what I'm doing. Little injuries all the time. Big ones. I'm, I'm too focused for big injuries. Oh. Well, this is a good segue to one of the questions that I thought we would answer first. What is a parkour pro? Or said it differently, what does it mean to be 
a professional parkour athlete. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, to be a professional in in what aspect, though? Because, like I say, I consider myself a professional because I have been paid to do events. I have like been given free merchandise, been sponsored, and as soon as cash changes hands, effectively you are professional, no matter what you're doing. If you're painting, you are a professional painter if you get paid for it. If you're tattooing, you're a professional tattoo if you get paid for it. So to me, a professional is someone who gets paid for it. In the past, I had been paid for it, so I would consider myself, I have been a professional, I'm not anymore. What about, is there a difference between getting paid, uh, getting paid pro level versus amateur level? Like amateurs get paid sometimes, maybe it's an internship or a small job. Is there a difference there? It depends on what you're doing on that aspect. So like, if you're an apprentice, you want a, a lesser wage. But if you're an apprentice, you're learning. You can't really apprentice to be a professional free runner or like to do parkour on a professional level because you're always training. You're always trying to get better. So in a parkour aspect, I suppose you're a professional when where you turn up, you're the best there. But at the same time, you're not, you're only the best there in some people's eyes. Other people are better than you at other stuff. So going back to where you mentioned David, and you comp I, I took that as an instant, I'll compare myself to David. We are the same at the skill level. So why is he professional and I'm not? Because he's got following on Instagram. So is he professional or is he a, an influencer? Right. What you're saying is if you if you show up, it's only going to give you money for your for your art for your parkour. Then you're so it's a case of if someone's willing to pay you a, a reasonable wage to be a, a make parkour be only thing you need to do. You are a professional. You want a minimum wage, but what would be a minimum wage nine to five? I would consider that you're a professional because you don't have to go do another job. But again, going back to David, he's not a professional in that aspect because he does other jobs to make money. He doesn't make money in parkour. He makes money in endorsements and making videos for people, doing photo shoots. He's out there working, like grinding nonstop because he's not making money in parkour, but yourself considered him a professional. You know, by the way, I'm connected with David Nelms on LinkedIn. And just today I saw a post from him and I commented on it. So I'm sure he'll see it. Oh, yeah. I did, I did that. Yeah, like, I'm not knocking against David. He's a good lad, but I only use him as an example because no, no, that no, was no. Example that was brought no. into conversation. Oh, yeah, I totally. I only use that as an example to say I know I know David and have been connected with him for a long time, and he did some work for yeah. us. He was one of our athletes a long long time ago. We have a yeah. funny video where we said Justin Bieber does parkour. And I remember that video. <laughs> I learned a lot of that video. I was like, was like we gave him a lot of thanks for that. Oh, good, good. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, that was like a, a low key dig, but also like a, a super high praise at the same time. Because now yeah. Justin Bieber is the man. Back then, people didn't like Bieber. You know, it was like pretty. Uh, you weren't supposed to like him, especially if you were a guy. So. That was funny, but uh, obviously a uh, very successful and talented individual, as is David. Uh, but he's more, in my opinion, he's more talented doing other stuff other than parkour. Like his talents is is a very talented athlete in that in part though, but his actual talent is his in video making, his photography, mm -hmm. his other outlets. Yeah, I think I've seen some of his drone stuff and it was fantastic. He's still doing yeah. drone stuff. He is. He's, he's also got a, another Instagram page which dedicated to that side of stuff, which oh, I don't know. is actually doing better than his actual Instagram. I'll have to check it up. Oh, it's doing better than his actual Instagram? Like, not for following why. But I'll look it up. What is it? You know what? I could, I'm, I'm on my phone on here, so I can't check. Ah, don't worry about it. Nah, don't worry. I'll send you a link over after, afterwards. Wow. So, Parkour Pro, somebody gets paid for what they do. Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe then the right phrasing is something like, because I don't want to get into it. There's too much nuance, but... Clearly, if two people have the same level, 
and someone has a thousand followers and someone else has a hundred thousand followers it's clear why from a business perspective the business would want to work with the person who had a hundred thousand followers at least in the short term if the business I just like, understand that. but at the same time it's going to be harder to get that person with the hundred thousand followers totally totally so you, you just got to find it like yeah you want these influence we want these big names but how yeah. big do you want to go up do you want to reach out to the Dom Tomatoes? Do you want to reach out to David? Or do you want to reach out to like, there's a lad up in uh, Manchester. He's a little bit younger than myself. He's been training a long time. It's, uh, I think his Instagram's got 250, maybe, followers because he's a parkour coach. Barely used Instagram. Probably Tim Champion level athlete. Kind of braids and a properly up there. No one knows him. Because he does, it doesn't do Instagram. Do you want them athletes? Yeah. yeah. Because they're the really good athletes what aren't chasing the ball. Right. You know, I went to the, maybe this was 2000, I want to say 17, but I don't recall. I went to the NAPC, North American Parkour Championships. They take place at Parkour Origins. You know of it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everyone knows of it. Okay. Never been. Never been. Um, well, we sponsor. We paid like 500 bucks to be a sponsor of the event. We went up, we had a booth and stuff like that. And it was pretty cool. And if I could go back, I would do it differently. But it was fine. And there was this athlete there that, that everybody in the community knew. But he didn't use Instagram. And he was one of the best there. This really quiet, kind of almost introverted guy. And I saw some of his videos and talked to people. And they're like, he's the guy. He's the guy. So I had brought up a bunch of product to sell at the event. And we had these, these pants we made at the time. They were just these really awesome pants. And I said, hey, I heard you're really great. Uh, I want to support you. Here's a pair of pants. And so thanks, you know. Blah, blah, blah. So I think that's kind of what you're talking about. You know, the thing is, yeah. is I, I don't know his name. Never heard from him. I don't know if he followed us on, on Instagram or I don't like, I literally don't know who he is and wouldn't even know how to find him. And, you know, for me, I don't care because, uh, someone who achieved that level, I wanted to support in that way. And I had the means to, I was like, here's a pair of pants. We have a thousand pairs at the warehouse. It's yours. But, you know, as a company you do, you'd like to get some return on what you do. You know, it'd be nice if that person gives you a shout out or whatever it may be. So, cause you can't do charity all day long. It's got to return to you. Otherwise, again, you don't have blood in your system. You don't have oxygen in your lungs. The company can't continue. So. Yeah, I think you're you're totally right. It's like you want to support the people that are that are real. You also gotta you also gotta get some money from it at some point. There's gotta be some some feedback loop. Otherwise, it's See, stuff this is why we're back my a point of Instagram basically being dead. Obviously, it re helps you reach out to other countries, other cities to get in them park off quick ten second clips. But it's not doing my community no favors. Like like you said, you. You don't know who this guy is, but you saw, you found he was like the greatest athlete ever. You don't know him, but he's the one guy going to the events. Like you need to be going to the events to see these guys who don't do much on Instagram, but they're going to the events. And if you can get them guys wearing your t-shirts, your trousers, your shoes at these events, it don't matter what we're doing on Instagram because yeah, people are seeing the events. Your, people see your time. Got you. It makes sense now. It makes sense now. You know the vision for giving shoes to pros isn't that they'll then post about it. It's that we open the door for them to love them. So what's different from a t-shirt is, is a shoe is unique. It's special. Uh, the barrier to entry is really high. So you and your friend and whoever it may be can't just go and all of a sudden have a shoe brand. And so the idea is, is if Dom's like, hey, I'd like a pair of shoes, right? The vision, my vision is simply that we send him a pair of shoes. Then he uh -huh. wears them. Dom's a bad example. He's again started his own shoe brand. Yeah, but oh, he, they don't even make shoes big enough for him. Our shoes wouldn't fit him anyway. I think he wears size 14 or 50. We don't even make that. I think they had, there's only like two clips of him wearing the shoes from his own brand. So you know, that either yeah. says, that's either that's something to you. Maybe, you know, that was funny. It's like the tangent store made a bunch of shoes and they didn't even wear the shoes. I was like, all right, well, that tells you all I need to know about those shoes. But uh, maybe yeah. your next ones will be better. Uh, but the idea is you find somebody, let's say Kadori, Michael Kadori. I've talked to him, great guy. The idea is, my vision was, and this is what you critiqued, was 
Michael's like, hey, I love to try a pair of shoes. You send him a pair of shoes. He's going to have a whole range of answers, but he could say, I don't like the shoes. They're not for me. He could also say, holy crap, I love these shoes. Like, can I have another pair of shoes? And then you build an authentic relationship because what happened with Take Flight was that I bought loyalty from people. It was like, hey, dude, uh, if we give you, uh, you know, two grand this year, do you want to be a part of our team? And the pros had no other options. They're like, yeah, sure. That sounds great. And so then, you know, they wear our shoes. They'll take a couple of photos because that's in the contract. And then when the money dried up, they're like, ah, I don't need to wear this stuff. See, that's why you want the people. Like when I reached out to you guys, my intention was, oh, cool. You know, I'm considering myself a reasonably good athlete. These guys giving out shoes. I need some shoes. I'll give them a whack. I'd pay for if I put a pair for my shoes. I'm not paying hundred quid to test them or hundred dollars to test them. But if these guys were to send me shoes, I'll be happy with that. And I can say for like, like for example, the, the trousers I wear. In every clip you'll see, I mean, these Scoochie extra baggy trousers. I have zero affiliation with them. I paid full price for these trousers. The only reason they're in every single one of my clips. Is because they are the only trousers I've found that are this comfortable. Like, there's, there was another company what recently went under, which made the, the XL crazy baggy joggers. But now, Scoochie is, or Scoochie is the only company I've found that make them. So I buy off them religiously because I love these trousers. My initial thought with your shoes was, this could be another one of them situations. But you don't know me, you don't know what my kind of mindset's about. So my, my initial thought was, if this guy sends me some shoes and I like these shoes, I found my next new shoe. I don't want to risk paying for them because I can't really afford the, the budget for them. But if they're as, as good as they are, I've got my next shoe. It's what I did with FP insoles. I paid full price for one of their, for a pair of their insoles. Went from a slightly cheaper option, the £35 mark. I then used them for a year. I've recently spent another sixty pound on another set of them because they're that good. I don't think well, I'm not. I'm not no longer thinking a bit spenny. I'm thinking they're that good, but I'm not going to put the initial first lump of money down to see if they're that good. If you know what I mean, I can't afford to. No, I, I love your ideas, um, and and I think your thinking is is uh, right on in a lot of ways. I think you have a lot of wisdom in in your approach and your in your processes. Really cool. I've really enjoyed our conversation. We're, um, you know, these usually tend to go about two hours. I think a two hours usually tends to be a really good conversation unless there's more things to talk about. Is there anything that you want to talk about? Anything that might create a good soundbite that you think is, is worth discussing and having people hear about or just a personal thing you want to talk about before we end the uh, Not really, no. Like, if you want to plug the WY uh, Instagram thing, you can. I can send you a link and put a little tagline in there. I mean, it's not a very active Instagram page of any, but that is our community page. Obviously, everyone has their own page as well, but that's just our personal community. Oh, dude, I'm following it, man. That looks cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so but on that, so for example, you might want some of the tapes I could run with, with some I've just literally just remembered from. What we've done there on the WI, we've built a spot map. Yeah. So if you've got the WI's Instagram and see on the description, there's a little blue link. You click yeah. that link, it'll send you to Google Maps. It then has not every spot, but all the spots we've ripped down so far. Every parkour spot in Leeds is now mapped for everyone. How good is that? Take Flight could do that. You could have your own parkour map on your website around your city. Find your your favorite spot. That's See, these are the things. That's how the takeovers are working. People are making these spot maps and then creating challenges at the spot. And then you have a full visual of how to find your way around the city to find these challenges. Whoa, here it finally popped up. Whoa, man, this is epic. Yo, are other cities doing this? Yeah. Oh man, we got to write about this for parkour.com. You know, this is awesome. Oh man, all these spots, holy crud. There's like a hundred spots, man. Yeah, this particular map was built by one of our locals, Hugo Knowles. He spent hours building this. Just like 
every time we go out, we take photos of each spot. I don't know if it's been fully updated yet, but the idea is you'll be able to click on a, on a, a, a tab and it'll show you, open up a window and it'll show you what the spot looks like. Yeah, keep, sorry, keep going. I'm, I'm yeah, so, going on, as you're saying. Yeah, and after the end game, we'll be able to have different videos able to play on it, but I don't think you can do that with Google just yet, with Google Maps. Obviously, it's, the idea is if you come to any city in England, and that community is going to ideally have a spot map, and then you go onto their community page, you find a spot map, you can either drop the community a message and say, I'm in your city, show me around, or you want to do your own thing, you can look at the map. You can go find all the favorite spots you've seen on YouTube. I love it, man. Well, you know, I'm 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 not can't figure out how to quite use it, but uh this is awesome. Wow. Yeah, that's brilliant. In fact, this is an idea that a friend and I discussed. He has a he has an AR company, augmented reality. And yeah. his idea was you could go to parkour spots and then you could like scan the spot and then you would what would pop up on your phone would be a video of somebody doing moves at the spot. Yeah. And uh, so we talked about this years and years and years ago. And uh, whoever figured out how to do that through Google Maps is brilliant. Bravo to them. We should write an article on parkour.com about that. That is just epic. Like that should be in every city, right? We should have, we should have like every city has like a link on parkour.com where you can find the maps, the parkour spots in those cities through parkour maps. That'd be a sick idea, man. <laughs> If you could do something like that, that would be a big boost to get parkour.com in balls in the actual like family of parkour. You're, you're not just a company outside. You're, been, you're not giving back, showing, getting all this information together in one place. And the community is going to love it. They're going to come, they're going to want to come to you to find out this information. Totally. No, that's a great idea. No, I, the way I, I see like Take Flight as a product company, you know, aspire, aspiring to make the best parkour shoes they can and maybe other merchandise like clothing, having their pro team, cool. And then I see parkour.com is like all about the community. Like, yeah. and, and suturing them becomes kind of this, this business idea, but it's like, it's Adam's two hearts. One heart is like, I have a cool company that makes awesome products that I love. The other one is like, how do we support people? How do we bring attention to what they're doing? How do we help propagate community initiatives that are growing the parkour community around the world? You know, it's these types of ideas, and this is one that would be awesome to to spread around. Oh, like you say, we're, we're, it's two hour mark and my phone's just dropped to 5%. So I think this would be a good place to, to call it. Stephen Wood, it was an absolute pleasure. We're going to give this a title like, uh, I don't know, Stephen School's Adam. Cause it's going to be, uh, <laughs> well, that's, I'm sure that's what it, what it sounds like. Is a, oh, the rumblings of a British idea. The, the ramblings of a British, uh, Business savant. Yeah. <laughs> <you are. laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for your time, your generosity, and for uh, having a great conversation on Instagram and also here on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on your podcast. It's been an experience. All right. Stick around just a second, my friend. Let me uh, end the recording, but stay for like one minute. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you next time. <laughs>